morning, everybody. Yeah. 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 Welcome to Tech Phoenix 2013. And I am Danny Cutler. I am sort of the, well, I'm one of the organizers. I kind of tell people what to do, and occasionally they do it. Awesome. So, <laughs> and um, I'm so glad you guys all made it out today. And I'm just going to cover a few quick things that are probably in the survival guide that I hope all of you received. Um, or saw on the website, and uh, just and some extra little tidbits just to help you get through the day without wondering what the heck is going on. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, oh look, we have a question. No. no. Oh, just wait, oh, wait, wait. Just oh. Wait. Oh. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, the schedules, as you have probably seen, they are at techphoenix.com/schedules. They are also posted. Everybody's session is posted outside of their room. So, um, as you're walking down the hall upstairs. It'll be listed as a nice big print. You'll be able to see who is speaking in what room and at what time. Um, let's see. Do, do, do. Every session will be upstairs. Last year we had some down here, but we're just doing the keynote, which is happening soon. And the closing tomorrow afternoon will be down here in the auditorium. And uh, let's see. What are those? Do, do, do. I hope you guys were not too flustered by the interesting parking situation this weekend. <laughs> so um, we definitely appreciate your guys' patience with the parking, and um, I don't know if you saw, we put it out on social media last night, but Uber, who is one of our sponsors, they're a driving service, uh, they are offering a 20, 20 or $25, I can't remember which it is. What was that? $25. Thank you. $25 <laughs> in free driving service uh, with, the, with the code Tech Phoenix. and for those who don't know, it's an app. You can contact them that way through the app and tell them where you're going. And it's for New Year's only. So if you only use Uber, thank you very much, Julie. <laughs> so that's Tech Phoenix. And that, if you don't want to go back and forth to, to Fry's Electronics, or if you want to maybe have a ride to the after party, because you can have some fun at the after party, and then you don't have to worry about driving back and forth. So, <laughs> um, so that's Uber. Uh, we want to thank, write some thank yous, definitely. Um, UAT. I have to thank UAT. Give a little... They post topics every year, and they're so gracious and generous and so easy to work with. And even this year, we have a UAT video crew wandering around, so prepare to be on video. <laughs> um, so they're going to be walking around, um, they're going to be interviewing speakers, and probably you too. They might just stop you and ask you some questions, so you know, have fun with it. It's, it's all about having fun this weekend. Yeah, learning too, but mostly about having fun. Um, we have other sponsors. We have Pagely, who does our uh, website. We have, who else? We've got Uber. Um, Local First AV is also a sponsor for us. They're a great uh, community, sticking with the local community. You've probably seen one of their ads at the Harkins Theater. They always have an ad up about, about being local. And, uh, they're great. Uh, who am I missing on our sponsors? So Midway Nissan. Oh, yes. Midway oh. Nissan wow. is sponsoring us as well. Thank you. And um, it's all on our sponsor page, so if I miss anybody, my deep apologies, but we do have them <coughs> on, so definitely go check out all of our sponsors. Um, food drive and raffles, hopefully you all brought canned goods, because we're doing our food drive again for raffle tickets, and uh, it's very successful last year, we like being able to give back. Um, and we have some other raffle things I'm going to go over in a minute, and we also, this is the t-shirt this year for, that's okay, for Tech Phoenix. Very basic, and I can't show you the back, but I can show you. I can show you my back. So I'm a geek. Mm -hmm. So there. <laughs> I have a model right here. So you guys. Oh yes, we have a nerd up there. Turn around and show them the back. Come down. Go. Yes. Yeah. Come on oh, down. Yeah. You're the next contestant. <laughs> yeah. So show them the back of your shirt. How awesome is that shirt? So you guys. Thank you. So, <laughs> Oh, let's see. Oh, also, 
with the shirts, another way to get some raffle tickets. If you take a photo of yourself showing off your geek or nerd pride, post it online and tag it with Tech Phoenix and Brand Brandex shirts, you get three extra raffle tickets. So uh, definitely give them some love and show off your geek or nerd pride. All right, let's see what else. Um, does everybody, I'm sure if, if you haven't read the survival guide, we talked about the law of two feet. We want to make sure that everybody gets the most that they can out of the sessions and sees everything they want to see. So you are welcome to get up and move about sessions. Speakers, unfortunately, cannot do this. I'm very sorry about that. That would be very awkward, too. So <laughs> speakers can't do it. But if there's something, you, you know, there's many sessions happening at once. So if you want to catch bits of each one, feel free to move. The speakers know, and you will not be reprimanded. So. At least not too harsh. <laughs> so, so do that. Um, we are also streaming everything. So if you go to the schedule page, you can click on the link for everybody's session and watch anything you want to see. And we're recording everything. So after the event, within a week or two, give us some time to go through all the footage. <laughs> we'll have everything available. So anything you missed or want to see again, or the speakers, if you want to share your session, it will all be made available to you. So there is, you will not miss anything. There's no... There's no missing any of the sessions at all. Um, tonight's after party, six to nine at the new main event. It's next to IKEA there on Ray and the I-10. Um, it's kind of like a, the only way I can describe it is like Game and Busters kind of thing, except they've got bowling and laser tag and a lot of extra things to do. Um, it's, it seems like a lot of fun, and we're the first group party to host an event there, so we're very excited about that, and we'll give, be giving them some love, and. Um, it's going to be a good time, so I hope you all make it out tonight from 6 to 9. Um, Sunday, starting a little bit later, we're starting at 10 because of the after party. <laughs> so, uh, um, registration will open at 9, um, but if you've already got your badge today, we don't really have to tell you that. So <laughs> you guys can just come back and bring your badges. And we hope that you do come back on Sunday. Another thing with the raffle items is you must be present to win. We will have many more amazing raffles tomorrow as well. And also, we have great speakers tomorrow too. And you know, all the speakers, we're so grateful to them to giving up their weekend to come out and speak and share their knowledge of the things that they do and they love. And um, you know, it's just as important on Sunday as it is on Saturday. So, uh, round of applause for speakers. So, the other thing I want to do, we're going to talk a little more about raffles first, but I want to introduce all of the red shirts. So um, there's a, there was a conglomeration of them over there. So anybody in a red shirt, stand up. A red Tech Phoenix shirt, I should say, because we have a red shirt here. He could stand if he wanted to, but. <laughs> so the, everybody's not in here. They must be working pretty hard, uh, making sure everything's all set up. But if you see anybody in this shirt, you are free to ask them a question bother them, hug them, whatever. Um, <laughs> we're, we're all moving on, on a lot of lack of sleep right now. And uh, well, right now, I can just tell you, Miles here is one of our tech guys. Wave, Miles. And uh, he's the one who's handling uh, all the streaming in the rooms and making sure that everything functions. So if you're a speaker and something isn't connecting right or whatever, Miles or Kevin, who's probably upstairs making sure all that is coming together, uh, will be able to help you out with that. And I've got Heather here, who is our, what we say? Raffle ringmaster. Yes, the raffle <laughs> ringmaster, and uh, she's the one who has put together this amazing raffle. I'm actually going to bug her now, and um, she has some extra notes about the raffles for you. So, give a hand, Heather. I am extremely excited about the amount of raffles that we have, as well as the quality raffle prizes that we have this year. One of the main raffle prizes that you should have seen as you pass the table is that we are giving away a Google Nexus 7 tablet this weekend. You do have to be present to win. It's going to be given away on Sunday at the closing. Uh, so keep that in mind. We have a raffle schedule posted out there with the raffle prizes because we have uh, over 30 raffle prizes to give away throughout the weekend and we're getting more raffle prizes coming in this weekend as well so we're going to have some impromptu raffle prizes uh, we're going to have some handwritten signs and some jars extra jars out there check back the table regularly because um, we have to swap them out constantly our first raffle prize today is going to be given out and uh, announced around uh, shortly after 10 o'clock and it's almost not it's just after nine now so keep that in mind 
before you hit your first session, drop off, um, check out the schedule, drop off some, some tickets, and we're going to be giving away prizes <coughs> regularly. Um, we're going to be announcing the winners on Twitter, on Facebook, and I'm also going to be writing them on the schedule, so you can check the table for winners. Uh, you can collect any raffle prizes that you win in room 208. And uh, my cell phone number is on the guidelines uh, for a better raffle experience sheet that's out there as well. Read through that. If you have any questions, you can text me. Anna, or that? anybody. Or grab somebody in a red shirt. Absolutely. Anytime. And well, if we don't know, we'll find somebody who does. So. Absolutely. Yeah. And another thing on the raffle, too, um, there's the three tickets for the Brand X shirt tagging. And you will get two extra tickets if you, I'm totally right now. Check in. Mm -hmm. check in. Yes. Check in. Foursquare, Facebook, Yelp, whatever. If you check in and show me, myself, or Perry, where's Perry? Did she leave? She left. She's around. <laughs> All right, so me or Perry, and we'll have to just point out who Perry is as we <laughs> go through it. Yes, Kelly Burnett. Very, she's cute. She's cute. But anyway, um, find one of us or the registration desk, and you get two more tickets for checking in. So show us your check-in. We want everybody to know what's happening today, because this is where it's going to be at. So um, that is about it. If you have any kind of questions, like I said, grab somebody in a red shirt, follow Twitter, follow Facebook. We'll be updating stuff and giving you information. But for now, I'm going to hand it over to Kevin. He's our other tech guy. Well, you have a question over here. Danny, and, uh, you have a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you buy the raffle tickets? Um, well, there is a way to buy them, because it's part of the food drive. So um, a dollar a ticket. And it goes to United Food Bank. Oh, nice. Up so to 10 tickets. Up to 10 tickets. We still have the 10 ticket limit. So. Nice. All right. So um, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Kevin, who's going to introduce our keynote. Thanks, everybody. Hey, everyone. So I'm sure Danny already said many times, welcome to Tech Phoenix. I'm excited this year because we do have a keynote. We've never done this in previous years. And I was really excited we could get Nicole and Mark Spagnuolo to speak for us. They seem to not think that that's a big thing. But I think it's a big deal because if you've been in podcasting, you know these two folks. I mean, you listen to uh, the morning stream. Nicole shows up on Wednesdays. The Wood Whisperer, of course, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. And if you listen to anything on the podcast network, they show up all the time. Way to the lead, so uh, comic dorks. Yeah. Uh, and so... But what's really exciting is these two folks, when they started doing podcasting, they were still doing day jobs. And they have since that time now become entrepreneurs. They are using social media and podcasting and all this stuff to earn a living. So to, to me, that's, that's impressive. I know it scares the crap out of me to think about stopping my job that has health care and <laughs> all that great stuff. And so... They're gonna tell. They're gonna talk about their journey along the way. So I'll just go ahead and, uh, without further ado, uh, welcome to Nicole Mark. Thank you. Right, I was like, are, are you sure you want us? I mean, if you get somebody better, we'll step down. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, Tech Phoenix, for giving us the opportunity because we were very surprised. Um, a lot of times we kind of just we play ourselves down. We try to yeah. be as humble as possible. There's so much to do. There's so such a huge ladder to climb that we like to think we're at the very bottom and we're always going up. So when someone asks us to do something like this, we're like, what do we really have to share? So we start breaking it down and we realize, well, we've done quite a bit in the time that we've done this. So if just sharing our story, telling you how we did things, what worked for us, what didn't work, we've got some of our oops moments yeah. in here. Um, hopefully that will either help or inspire you or steer you in the right direction, tell you what not to do, maybe. All right, so we figured we'd start out with who we are today. In case you're not aware, I'm Mark Spagnuolo. That's my wife, Nicole Spagnuolo. Uh, we have a couple of different websites, and a lot of like smaller websites that don't really amount to a whole lot, but the primary website is thewoodwhisperer.com. It's a free website for woodworkers to learn about woodworking, share their experiences woodworking, and get inspiration on building projects. Uh, we later on developed the woodwhispererguild.com, which is a membership website where we actually have people who pay a fee to see really high quality videos that go into a lot more depth in projects. Uh, the guild site, the membership site, has about 4,400 members right now. Uh, our website, the primary website, the Woodwhisperer, gets about 300,000 visits a month and about a million and a half page views a month. And now this year we employ two people, me and her. Yeah, I, yeah, cool. I, I came from a uh, I guess a presenter background. I, w I was a professional speaker for a company that sold software for colleges and universities. Um, 
So working on the Wood Whisperer on the side while still kind of, kind of being the safety net uh, was really, we did this, we started this back in 2006. So it's been kind of a, a long-term goal and the fact that we were able to actually do that this year um, kind of excited us. So Very scary. yeah, it was scary, exciting, and definitely out of our comfort zone. But uh, what Robert Allen, I think one of his, his quotes is, um, everything you want is just outside your comfort zone. So the cookie's not working. I know, the cookie's not working. There, there we go. <laughs> So uh, we'll start really at the beginning of this uh, whole adventure. It was back in 2006. This is when podcasting was still fairly new. It was definitely new to us. I started listening to some tech podcasts and uh, all the guys from all the people from Tech TV who started to make audio podcasts and uh, online. That was what really fascinated me. Uh, but at the time, I was running my custom furniture business and trying to make a go of it. My background is in molecular biology. That's what I did for a living prior to deciding to become a woodworker. Because that makes perfect sense. Right? <laughs> uh, so I was doing my best to make this business work, and we were at a point where Nicole was like, "Look, I need X dollars a month for us to survive." It was five hundred. Five hundred bucks, 500. right? <laughs> I couldn't do it. I mean, it was very difficult. Being a custom furniture maker, and especially having a new business, is insanely difficult to actually make a profit and get a dependable amount of money every month. So I, I really had a hard time. Uh, but in my downtime, I got my first MacBook uh, laptop, and I was messing around with iMovie, and I started playing around with making videos, and decided that that might be one of two things, either just a good hobby for me, a distraction, or possibly something to facilitate the relationship with my customers. If I'm going to charge $5,000 for a piece of furniture, I want to give that person a journey and show them how I went from a stack of boards to this really high-end piece of furniture. Why should they pay me $5,000? It was kind of a marketing vehicle for me to show them what the true value of that furniture was. Now that never happened, uh, because the things that we did for fun turned into something much greater than we expected. Um, but Nicole at the time was busy working. Yeah, I was <laughs> traveling a lot with my job. Um, and in fact, the I think the only reason the Wood Whisperer came about was because I was on travel I, two months solid. I didn't come home. So he was bored. <laughs> So. I, hadn't, I hadn't discovered World of Warcraft yet, so <laughs> stuff to do. Okay. So I came, I came home from a trip, and he's like, "Look, honey, what, look what I did." I'm like, "Okay, rock on." Um, and that was that's kind of how the Wood Whisperer was born. Was out of his boredom and lack of uh, videos for woodworking. So he was just eating up woodworking videos, and he couldn't find enough. And he's like, "There's nothing out there." And and I will say, because when we started, we were really kind of the first woodworking niche on the scene. So we had the advantage of being first. So that's not always the case. You don't always have to be first. A lot of times you can be, you know, have, a, have better quality or better customer service. So there's other things that can help you. So don't fixate on being first um, on whether or not, whether to start or not. Well, a good example is uh, a company that's almost never first, but seems to do the best in a lot of people's eyes is Apple. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, we're going to take you through um, just kind of. <laughs> uh, exactly. That was my addition to the slide. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to take you through kind of um, our. I mean, when we started back in 2006, we we're very young, very naive. Pie in the sky, oh, we're going to start our own business, right? And Mark's, you know, never done woodworking for a profession before, so his idea. We can do this, of course we can. But um, I think one of the things we did right early on was um, talking with peers. So for Mark, um, reaching out some other woodworkers that had been successful um, and getting their, their thoughts and opinions. And... Do you want to tell a story about David? I mean, yeah. Because I think that was one of your turning points and kind of that took us down this path. Right, yeah. Before I actually left my job, um, there was a woodworker named David Marks who did a show on TV for a while. Uh, absolutely uh, admired the guy. He's an idol. Even to, to, like at this point, now that he's a friend, he's still someone who I aspire to be as a woodworker. Um, he started teaching classes. So Nicole put in the bill and sent me up to Northern California to work with the guy. And it just really spawned this beautiful relationship with someone who has taught me so much. Uh, but one of the most important things he was teaching me as a professional woodworker was the value of having a lot of balls in the air at once. Because, yeah, uh, just in general as a business. I mean, in some businesses, multitasking or having too many products can be bad. 
for us, it was really the thing that kept us afloat all the time because uh, if my attorneys weren't selling, my furniture might be selling. If those weren't selling, then maybe this veneer that I'm selling on the side might be able to pull in some money. And if that's not working, then maybe the refinishing that I do will keep things afloat. And that's really classes. how Classes, you were doing one-on-one That's right, classes. I forgot about that. Yeah. yeah, I was teaching classes out of my shop, which was a nightmare, but uh, we <laughs> did it and... Um, so I'm, I'm actually curious, how many in here are, are podcasters? Sort of. Sort of. <laughs> looking into. Um, how many are here that are looking just to start an online business, potentially? A few. The rest of you are just kind of here. No. <laughs> You're walking by. You already have. You already have. Oh, that's great. Yeah. How many already have an online business? Oh, that, that's a much more. Oh, great. So, you know, we're going to talk. We kind of lean back on the podcasting, but it's really online content. When you look at our business, our business is videos and online content and providing customer service and things like that. That's our real... Well, and that's where this kind of thing, maybe a brick and mortar store, when you're talking about your inventory that you hold, you have very different concerns than when you're producing information, content, online information products. You can actually diversify it. And in most cases, the more stuff you have out there, it's more lines in the water and you can catch a fish that way. So um, for us, it just made a lot of sense to have a lot of different things that we could depend on for the yeah. business. Next slide, please. I know, right? <laughs> Come on. I'm just going to stand there. Okay. okay, so 2007, we started the, the whole thing as a bit of a lark. And next thing you know, it was getting a lot of attention. So the theme of 2007 for us was legitimization. I was nobody in the woodworking world. Uh, I had to get to a point, or try to get to a point, where people would take me seriously. Uh, I started thinking, if we could just pull in, I don't know, if I could get enough Google AdSense revenue to put gas in my car this month, that would be amazing. You know? I, re I remember having a conversation with Mark, and we're like, we got a dollar a day. Yeah. It's $30 a month. We can go to dinner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so what we decided as a... It wasn't so much a deliberate strategy, it just kind of made sense at the time. Uh, we caught the attention of a popular woodworking magazine, and the folks at the website contacted us and said, hey, we'd like to put some of your videos on our website, because they weren't really getting into the video at that time. Uh, we said, yeah, sure, but can we, you know, can we start saying sponsored by so-and-so at the end of our videos? And they were like, well, of course, because it's free advertising for them. For us, it was a matter of if we say, and I don't mind saying the name of the company, it was Fine Woodworking, they're you know, one of the best magazines for woodworkers out there. So we figured if they're willing to put their name at the end or beginning of our video, then that legitimizes us in other people's eyes. Now, they're not paying anything for this at all. There was no charge whatsoever. Dollar-wise. Dollar-wise. <laughs> but what we were able to do then was to parlay that into real sponsorships with woodworking companies that make tools. So they said, oh, well, if fine woodworking takes these guys seriously, <laughs> we probably should too. And I don't know that that tactic will work for anyone else, but it definitely worked for us at that time. Um, so we were able to uh, to take that fake sponsorship and turn it into something that was real with uh, check and tools and things associated with and it. And we really got involved in our niche community. I mean, we got involved. We, we went to this um, conference in Las Vegas called AWFS, and it's a large woodworking conference. And we contacted them and said, hey, can we get a press pass? I mean, it's very common nowadays, but at during then, they were like, uh, okay. And we covered it like it was like this rock star event. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, it's that, and, and that, that goes across the board. Whatever business you're in, there are probably industry events, things like this. This is a great networking opportunity for you. So this was very deep into our industry, but it allowed me to go and put a camera in front of someone's face. And when they're sitting in a booth for three days, that's what they want. They want that exposure. So most of them have this spiel ready to go. And I was like, all right, here you go. Tell me about your product. You got two minutes. And then we would take that video, bring it back to the website. And that kind of greased the wheels with companies that would later become future sponsors and future or advertisers. advertisers. Yeah. Making face to face. I mean, it, it's important to make, I mean, we live in a digital world, online email, but it really is important to make those face to face contacts and, and form um, your networking. I like think think of it as friendships I and mean, mm -hmm. kind of become friends and people want to do business with people they like. So it it's all works together. It's a win-win for everyone. Um, we also went out to Ontario, California to um, the Podcast and New Media Expo. Uh, Mark and I have um, uh, a thing that we like to do is, is really kind of listen to as much business 
podcasts, read as many business books. Uh, we may not get everything you possibly, you know, there, it may not speak to us directly, but there might be one little nugget that we go, ah, oh, I never thought of it that way. So kind of starting off and, and going to this New Media Expo, which is now in Las Vegas, and it's just called the New Media Expo, um, gave us an opportunity to meet other podcasters. Um, I, I, I met Don McAllister that year. You were there too, weren't you? Yeah, we met Izzy for the first time. And honestly, Izzy should be up here as well, <laughs> because Izzy has been a, a, a big factor in our business growth as well, and kind of collaboration, and hey, I tried this out, or hey, have you tried this? And so it's, it's a very small community, and we're all kind of trying to work together, to, especially in 2007, to figure this thing out. So, because nothing, I mean, there was no rules. There still really aren't many rules, so. It was easy back then. I just went to Izzy's site and said, I'll do that. <laughs> and I'll put woodworking around it, and no one will know. <laughs> just like that. Uh, we also, at that time, because this was, again, still very early, but we were unique in, in this category, uh, had a couple of opportunities come up for TV. Uh, either a producer who wants to produce a show, maybe shoot a pilot and shop it around. Um, there's a couple different ways that it can happen, but um, we had explored the option, talked about it, and it just didn't feel right. It felt like we were uh, cutting this whole internet side of the, the business out too early. Because in order to do the TV thing, you really have to dedicate yourself to mm -hmm. pursuing that. And a lot of times it's pursuing high dollar sponsorships to support the show. And I figured, well, if I could just, you know, Instead of getting all these companies to each put out two hundred and fifty thousand dollars for this show, what if I get one of them to give me forty? I probably have the same amount of money in my pocket when it's all said and done, and I have nobody to answer to, and I don't have to trim my show down to twenty minutes because that's what TV requires. Uh, so we we close the door on that pretty pretty early on. And and I think we were in a learning phase. I mean, we're we're still at the start, and you know the sky's the limit in in our our minds, and and I think. Um, yeah, the the whole it, it's it's weird because it, it crops up every once in a while. It cropped up again this year, and we're like, really? I don't know. So you have to decide with your business what's important to you. For us, it's lifestyle. So we're not necessarily going. We want to grow this business. You know, we watch Shark Tank. And you're like, yeah. <laughs> grow this business to a multi million dollar. We're like. We just want to have enough money to take our kid to the park and not have to worry about, you know, answering to anyone. So that's kind of where we come from. So you, in your journey, have to decide, you know, what what is your goal. Okay, 2008. All right, so the, I don't know if you want to say anything else about what was different in that expo. But. Um, th uh, I wanted to mention, because we went in 2008 again to the, the New Media Expo, and this is where we met some of our Frog Pants. So Kevin mentioned um, we're part of a, a podcast network called Frog Pants, uh, run by Scott Johnson, who has a, an insane library of shows. And we kind of all came together, this band of misfits, um, because of the relationships we forged at this one conference. This is where we met Patrick Beja and Randy Jordan and Scott Johnson, which over the years we played World of Warcraft with them, we forged friendships, not necessarily anything initially business-wise, but over time, again, it, we didn't think of it as networking, we thought it as you know, meeting people that we idolized and wanted to be friends with. So, and that's kind of, it just kind of over time grew into the, the whole Frog Pants uh, network that is today, and so now we're, um, working with and uh, Tom Merritt who does um, uh, Tech News Today on Twit. Uh, the, and that started with the next thing, which is building the gadget station for Leo Laporte. Yeah, it's, it's kind of funny. I, I knew that if we, it's amazing how if you give someone a really nice gift, you can kind of open doors for yourself. Like if it's <laughs> someone you want to meet, make them something great and bring it to them. They, they say yes to these things. Uh, Nicole had idolized Leo Laporte for years. We, I mean, we used to watch Tech TV oh, yeah, all the time. Yeah. Uh, so when the it was ZDTV, that's how yeah. long I watched yeah. it. Yep, yep. I mean, I loved Leo Laporte. So in the early days of uh, Twit, when, when Leo was kind of just doing his own thing, uh, we decided that, you know what, if I design a project that would be something he could really use, very specific to what Leo does in, in the world of tech, and we just offer to, like, no strings attached, we drive it up and deliver it. Nicole will get to meet this guy. And it was really, I wasn't even thinking business-wise that it was a good move. I was just thinking it would be fun for her. 
So I built this uh, thing that I probably would have charged maybe three grand for if I were building it for a client. And it was a charging station, essentially a very elaborate and nice wooden charging station that you could put all kinds of devices, iPods, phones, whatever you have. Um, and we drove it up there, delivered it to them, and this wasn't our intention, but we wound up getting on one of the shows on, on just being interviewed essentially by Leo, uh, which was great. It was a 12-part series on the website, and the last part of the series is me delivering this thing to Leo on his show. Uh, was fantastic, but that alone put in Leo's head that when I think of online woodworking, I think of the Wood Whisperer. So he'll mention us periodically just for whatever reason. He thinks of someone who's just kind of independent doing it on their own. He'll throw our name out there. He probably doesn't remember our actual names. But, <laughs> but it's that whole first in mind yeah. kind of concept. He thinks of that. So it was a little seed that was planted. And again, back to that legitimization, uh, when, when, he, when someone recognizes you, a lot of times that is part of the legitimization process. Uh, so we gave him a very expensive gift, and uh, then I came back and decided to make my first DVD. Just because I'm already making video, why not make a DVD and just see how it does? Um, then this is just a very simple process of finishing. It wasn't anything complicated. It's about 40 minutes long, and that still today is one of the best selling products that we that we make. And I really need to make something else because <laughs> it's like you leave money sitting on the, the table and you don't make the, the stuff. The lesson in this one for us was. Not everybody wants to watch uh, videos online. I mean, th this is before the days of really. Did we were we in TiVo yet? I don't think so. I mean, no, it was not very. That time. I mean, only the like really techy techy people were putting videos on their TV. I mean, now it's getting more and more common, but still you can't discount old ways of distributing content. So the DVD was kind of a surprise for us and, and how well it did sell. And we sell the digital version too. So yeah. we give both, both of those. And knowing your audience is extremely important. Yeah. I, you know, it's woodworkers. So we tend to, you know, be on the other side of the scale, usually 50, 60 years old. It's very common uh, for woodworkers. And a lot of these guys want a DVD for whatever reason. So the numbers are changing now. I think we, we definitely outsell by at least twice as many uh, digital versions of that title than we do with the actual hard copy. Uh, so we were actually uh, offered a buyout. This was when I was still working, uh, sort of working with a woodworking magazine. And I think it, we got to a point where, I don't want to say that they were threatened, but I don't think they completely understood what we were doing and how they could replicate it for themselves. But they knew it wasn't going to be good to continue to, to throw love <coughs> my way because it was just putting more people onto my website. Mm -hmm. uh, so they actually offered to buy us out for... Sixty thousand dollars, something like that, that seventy-five thousand, yeah. um, and, and it was all tied into a, um, a thing where I was actually producing exclusive content for them, and it just felt like a strong arm kind of move. Like they just wanted to get rid of it, they wanted to own the property, and then probably flush it down the toilet two weeks later. <laughs> so we said no, thank you. And then I started writing a column for Popular Woodworking Magazine, um, which was just a very simple thing. Great opportunity for someone like me to actually be able to write for a print magazine. Uh, that was huge uh, in terms of the whole legitimization process. But oh, I didn't know you put that slide. In. <laughs> nice. Surprise. Yeah, so uh, 2009. <laughs> I look good with long hair, don't I? Do. Too bad because my hair isn't that straight when it's. Uh, 2009 was all about a paradigm shift for us. We did have sponsors at this time. We had uh, two sponsors, and we started to see the writing on the wall that over time sponsors can go away. Um, they're really fair weather friends. So if things are going well, they're going to give you money. If they're not, uh, they're just going to find something else to spend their marketing dollars on. So we saw the writing on the wall and decided we needed to really take matters into our own hands. If we could work directly with our customers and provide video for them and they pay us directly, that's a much more satisfying relationship. If you're happy with the product, you'll pay for it. There's no numbers issues. It's just i got to make good stuff, and then you pay for it. So we started the Wood Whisperer Guild, our paid membership site, and this this was a big move for us because many um, many nights of going, are we doing the right thing? Are we doing the right thing? How do we approach it? Because we still had a free site, and to populate the guild, it could have been easy. I mean, because that's one of the the things that Izzy did was look at his free and then put it behind a paywall, and we're like, do we want to do that? Is that the right approach for us? And so, you know, looking at how we wanted to approach it, so. We, the, the membership site really was like a hundred people just going, I know they're going to give me something good. <laughs> well, I mean, that, there was a lot of trust in those Well, first. there was three years of free content yeah. on our website, building trust with, with all these people. 
and we had pretty good numbers at the time, so it was kind of a calculated thing that a certain percentage of them would buy into this just because they trust us. They, they like what we've done so far. And we did look at what uh, Izzy was doing with Izzy Video and seeing what was working for him and deciding is that exactly right for us or do we do something a little different? So what we decided to do was keep all of the free stuff out there. We're not taking anything away. And this just made me feel better to, to be able to announce this to my audience to say, look, I'm not taking anything away from you guys. I'll still make free content. But if you're interested, there's this other thing that we've made, and it's a membership website that you can join. So don't give me crap about it. Because <laughs> as soon as you, if you have a free resource and suddenly you start mentioning money, whoa, you know. It's, Especially on YouTube. Oh, my God. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. So, yeah, that's when the paid membership started. And, um, you know, initially we started it because it was so reluctant to put more work on my plate. We were like, let's just make it like a discount club, and we'll call companies, and they'll offer discounts, and people pay 30 bucks a year to get access to discount codes. Um, and then as it went on, we just realized, we realized well, we had an international audience. We really couldn't do that. Yeah, that wasn't going to work that well. And what we do best is content. So if I can provide better content, unique content, I now have something above and beyond my free tier to offer these people. And we had no choice. If we're going to do it, it has to be content, and that's what we did. And the reason why I put, we started the Movie Delicious in, uh, well actually I started the Movie Delicious and Lady Elite with friends that I had met at the New Media Expo. Um, this was just something fun that we did on the side. Honestly, I don't think it ever, ma it ever made any money. Lady Elite a little bit. If I decide, I, I always feel like these projects are my kind of fun projects. And if I did want to take it to another level, I probably could, but I like to keep them fun. And so, you know, we, we like to have our outlets too. So we kind of focus on our, our the Wood Whisperer as our, our business, you know, that's our business. And then all the things that we do, just because we enjoy being on the internet, um, those are kind of our fun things. But um, there, I guess my point is, it doesn't always have to yield money, but and it can lead to other things. So I can't quantify it, but I know there are, there are people that have listened to the movie Licious and found the Wood Whisperer and it's all kind of connected. Yeah, the other thing at that time, we were listening to, was it the Podcast Brothers? Yeah. Is that what they had? Yeah. Okay, so at the time, in 2000, around 2009, they were really pushing advertising. And we were you know, just kind of taking advice from people who knew more than we did. Yeah. And they were like, look, you've got to have people every day making calls, making calls, trying to get advertisers. So we did try that methodology of actively pursuing advertisers, making those calls, and trying to, to hook them in. And that yeah, did not work. <laughs> I mean, at least in, in our industry, that did not work at all. Yeah. So we were just uh, spinning our wheels, and we realized that taking a more passive approach to advertising, having such a great product and a, a good website with a lot of traffic makes them want to work with us. And right now, we're at the point we no longer make any calls for advertising. We wait till they call us, and we've got a big block of ads on our website. I don't know what it does for them. I know I give them page views, but... People are so banner blind these days. I don't know what static ads do for people. I probably shouldn't say that publicly, but <laughs> <laughs> they're not watching it probably. So, um, you know, but ultimately, the advertising thing was something we realized we were wasting our time actually trying to convince these people to advertise with yeah. us. Oops. All right, 2010, sharing love. So this is where things really started to, to grow. The numbers were getting pretty big. And one of the things I think Nicole and I have always tried to do is to be as charitable as we could. And I think when you've got a sizable audience, I just feel there's sort of a moral obligation to occasionally use that power for something good. Uh, and not just providing content, but charity if you can. So we started uh, Woodworkers Fighting Cancer in 2010. And we kind of, I, I try to push the monetary pressure onto companies. We've got great relationships with companies. So I have them sponsor the event, and I put a project out there for people to build. And everyone who builds it and sends me a picture, these companies then donate five bucks to the charity. So the person who's building is not actually spending a lot of money on it. We're putting it into the pockets of big companies, but meanwhile raising a ton of money for, for the charity. So we've donated to American Cancer Society, Live Strong. Uh, this year we're donating to Cancer Care. And we've raised over $25,000 for cancer charities since we started this in 2010. Um, so that, that's just one of those feel-good things that we like to do every year. Um, one of the things that, that I really enjoy, um, my background, is uh, programming. So I'm watching in 2010 just the app store blow up. I'm like, why are we not in the app store? So uh, how do I make an app? One thing about running your own business is you can never 
not do something because you don't know. You figure it out. The internet is your resource. There is so much out there just waiting for you um, to learn. So I, da I got my developer's license. I downloaded Xcode, and I'm like, whoa, I, have, I don't really have time to learn Objective-C. There has to be an easier way. Well, there are. There's, there are these things called mobile frameworks. And it's even better now than it was in 2010. And there's tons of them. So the one that I was using at the time was a, a site called AppMaker. And it literally, I just plugged in my RSS feeds. I put in some artwork, boom, bada, boom. And I have now a presence in the App Store. We have had people contact us and say, I had no idea you had a website. <laughs> I've only, that's how I know you is through, through the app. That's how I found you. Because we were the only woodworking app um, out there. Yes, I mean, if you time. have a content driven website and you can get one of these, you know, it's a simple mobile framework, it's totally RSS driven. So yeah. if you're making content, you have RSS feeds. It's not really the best way to have an app. You know, there's other more efficient ways yeah. to design apps. But, but if you're content driven, <coughs> this stuff is there. So, I mean, you should be doing this to at least have some presence in an app store. One of the things that Mark and I have done from the beginning is try to bootstrap as much as possible. We, we value people's time, so we want to pay them. Well, some, especially in the beginning, we didn't have the money to pay them. So we would trade and barter and things like that. I had a, a friend that would do artwork for us, and I, I, since I was traveling so much, I had miles, and I would send them to New York and all places. And that was how we kind of got that earlier stuff done. Um, I, I hope by taking you through the years, it, where we are today just didn't happen overnight. And I know a lot of people feel like they have to do everything at once. So building this app, I looked at it as just another vehicle, another place for people to find us. So when we put out our videos, we had put them on Blip TV, we had them on YouTube. I remember them being there uh, early on in 2007, all these early HD, because Mark was oh, yeah. really big on HD. Night, HD so we had all these different places that, that, that anybody could find us, and really taking that time to kind of get that exposure. And, that, and the iOS app for us, um, that was one of the things that we did. Um, the iOS app is still out there. In fact, if you go into the store right now, I have two of them. Um, I have a free one, and then I have a premium one that I typically pay for, but it's free right now because I need to update it. <laughs> but the reason why I decided to do it myself is because I was getting quotes for $45,000 for a simple uh, uh, app that I wanted to pull my RSS feed. We've got a funny app store. Well, it's not yeah, that funny because we'll it involves me losing money, but we'll <laughs> <laughs> talk about app stuff in a bit. And then again, kind of going back to the networking and friendships, um, because of the relationships that we had forged a few years back, um, I was invited to be on one of Scott Johnson's podcasts, The Final Score, which brought us into the Frog Pants Network and kind of our participation in, in this event called Nertacular, and it's like one big geeky fun place. <laughs> I still kind of always am like, how did we get here? Okay. Yeah, 2011. Yeah. That was the year of survival for us. Um, Nicole had a horrible pregnancy. It was uh, seven or eight months of absolute hell for her. Sick the entire time. And then our son was born seven weeks early. So this is late 2011. And that just kind of, when you're running a business that takes about 50 to 60 hours a week of your time, we're working weekends, nights. I mean, there was really no structure in the time frame that we did our work in. It was just whenever we had time. Uh, so we just worked every day. People always all ask, how do, you, how do you have the time to do all this? Well, we didn't have a kid. Yeah. <laughs> so that was one thing we realized. That knocked us for a loop because now, you know, obviously in the beginning, there's just the, everything's thrown on the wall. It's just kind of crazy. but. We got to a point where it's like, okay, now we have this kid. So we work from nine to five. Uh, now we have this this obstacle. <laughs> he's, he's the cutest obstacle in the world. <laughs> but you know, we've got to structure our life so that work happens between nine and five. And then when he comes home, it's about him. It's about family. And the weekend is about family. I still work weekends if I absolutely have to, but I really try not to. So now I'm trying to fit basically 60 hours of work into a 40 hour work week. And that's really, really tricky when you're trying to run a membership site, a free website, all these different things that we even do for fun. Um, things have to start dropping off and you have to really pare it down to what's truly important uh, to the business. 
All right, so there are a couple other things that happened this year that were kind of crazy. Um, we had a company, an internet company, whose job it is to basically buy out other internet companies and then exploit them for advertising, offered us a uh, million dollars for our website. Now, it's, you know, woodworking is a niche area, so because I've been making content since 2006, and I've been following just general good practice for SEO, I'm not an SEO freak by any means, but uh, we just try to make sure all the keywords are in place, we've got really good uh, standing in search engines, and you search for certain things in Google, boom, you're going to find one of our articles. Now, to me, I don't think much about it, but to someone who goes, wow, if I put some ads on that and I position this properly, uh, we can really make a lot of money on this website. So they gave us this million dollar offer and we had to turn it down because I asked myself, what would I do if I sold the company? What would be my next move? Well, I'd first take a couple days off. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then I would rebuild a new woodworking website because my passion in life is woodworking. And I would start producing content and then I would try to rebuild this thing up under a different brand. And I thought about it. I'm like, why the hell would I do that? I own the money making machine now. Why would I want to dump it and recreate it and try to do it again? And, and I got, I think, I got pretty lucky this time around. Am I going to be lucky again? So a million dollars sounds nice, but after taxes and all that, how much is that really going to help us, especially now that we have a stock? So we turned it down. Uh, so that was, it was very weird, but we walked away from it. A couple months later, we were hit by one of the scariest things that have ever happened to us. We were DDoSed twice. So there was a period of time where our site In was completely months, inaccessible. Yeah. So if you're not familiar with a DDoS attack, essentially, in a sort of brick and mortar analogy, it's kind of like you have a store and you've got a door for people to come in the shop, but there's so much traffic on the street that the actual customers can't get in. And this is what a DDoS attack is like. They flood you with traffic that isn't really doing it. They're not actual customers on your website. You're just flooded with tra traffic inundating your server so that your actual customers can never get to your website. This went on for about two months. And we went through various, and if anyone really wants details on how to defend yourself against DDoS attacks, we'll give you some of the details. But we learned a lot. <laughs> yeah, uh, but we have to, had to do specific IP filtering, we have to pay for services, and this is like, our business is sinking, we need help. So we wound up at that point moving to Rackspace uh, for our host, because they have a great managed, it's super expensive, but a great managed server uh, plan. And we wound up getting our own servers there. The attack was still going on at this time. We just knew we needed someone to help us navigate the waters and, and get this thing fixed. So we used their DDoS protection service. Cost about $6,000 to start it. And then another $1,200 a month. I couldn't sustain that for very long, obviously. So the question was, who's going to run out of money first? Me or the person paying for this DDoS attack? Because they were paying a lot of money. It was uh, 9 gigabytes a second hitting our website to the point where we were like the talk of Rackspace's security team. They're like, you do, you do woodworking, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we don't, uh, You're not we're a not bank or a political website or anything like that. It's woodworking. That's yeah, it. it was. It, and we still to this day have no idea who or why. We never will. We came right out. Exactly. Oh, we're not going to say that. <laughs> we're not going to say that. I we'll let you draw your own conclusions. <laughs> but we, we we would never know. And honestly, if that were the case, I would have expected a phone call to say, like a couple months later, hey, how's business going? Are you interested in selling? But I'll tell that you right happens. now, we had many times where Mark's like, I'm just going to get, no, we are fighting. We are going to fight this. And this is when we, were, we weren't on rap space yet. So I knew we needed to get to a place that could give us managed support, that we didn't have to worry about the server. One thing we didn't say in the beginning is our website started out as a GoDaddy $4 economy hosted website. Wow. And over the years, we've gotten booted off. <laughs> so, you know, GoDaddy said, yep, And sorry. every time, it's a surprise. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I mean, the first time, Go GoDaddy's like, look, you guys aren't being good neighbors, too much traffic. I'm like, but I'm a woodworking website. What are you talking about? Yeah. And then we went to Media Temple. Yeah, Same thing happened on Media Temple. Yeah. And eventually we got to Rackspace. Yeah. Uh, in that year as well, um, because I didn't have enough to worry about, I decided to publish my own book. Uh, we used Lulu for yeah. the printing. And I wrote a very small book. It's, it's not big at all. 70 pages. Um, yeah, yeah, it's more like a pamphlet with a hard cover. Um, it's called Finishing, It Ain't Over Till It's Over, and um, it had illustrations done by my friend Scott Johnson. So again, just knowing people and calling in favors is always a good thing. And uh, yeah, so that, well, that was Well, one of the things that we did for the artwork is I traded, I said, I'll make you some apps. I, so I made him an Instance app, I made him uh, the Nerdtacular app, so I made a bunch of different apps for him 
in exchange for, for the artwork that, uh, that he did for us. <coughs> So this is 2012, one step forward. Uh, this was when we decided that, all right, we've got our free apps out there. And the app space is very important to us. It's a huge market right now. So we figured, should we have a companion app for our membership site? Should we have a way for people to not only access their videos uh, on a mobile device, but also to get new customers in the mobile environment who perhaps haven't heard of us? So we decided to, to go forward with this. We found an app developer that seems really good, and we gave them a deposit. And as we started getting into the conversations with them, it became pretty clear that this was not the right move for us. A membership on my website costs um, $129 for a year. The cheapest project, if you want to buy a la carte, is about 30 bucks. In the app space, convincing someone to spend $30 who doesn't already know you is a very tough thing to do. It may, I mean, especially when you're competing against, you know, 99 cent purchases and all these well, little tiny... And Apple has their own restrictions, and they kind of tweak them every once in a while. So you have to have a way to accept payment through mm. their stuff, not outside yeah. of it. And our system... So trying to integrate that with our website, it just became this big mess of spaghetti. I'm like, this is just going to be another thing for us to worry about. So instead, maybe what we should do is can this whole app idea and just make sure that our membership website is as mobile friendly as possible. Responsive design. Yeah, and, and that's where we're headed. But in order to get out of this thing, because I had already given them a deposit, I lost four grand in the process, uh, which really sucked. But it was indecisiveness on my part that was the cause. I can't, they could have been more generous in how much they gave me back, but uh, they did lose some time in, in getting some initial development done, and I lost 4,000. But it's better than losing Fifteen thousand dollars, or, or, or you know, knowing when to say eh, maybe we were wrong on this. Yeah, or worse yet, putting a product out that just right. isn't quite working right, and now we have to worry about it. Yeah. Uh, at that time, we also launched new versions of both of our free and paid websites. Um, Got to constantly keep these things updated. I think, you know, improvements for usability. It shows people that you actually give a crap about your website. It's not a bad idea to iterate once in a while and make things a little bit better for your users. Mm -hmm. And we do actually pay developers to build the new framework that actually works for us. I couldn't find a WordPress theme for the life of me that would organize my archive of videos in a way that was easy to search. And so we had someone actually do some custom development in WordPress to design this whole thing that just worked perfectly. And I've never really seen anything else out there like it, but it works great for us. Mm -hmm. And then I mentioned Nertacular, and the reason why I bring this up is, you know, those friendships Nertacular itself is kind of becoming, Scott's doing his own thing, and, and so we have this kind of collective mind share among the podcasters in this group. And so, like, for instance, I remember when we launched the Guild, I was like, I, I know I need to do a press release on this, but I hate writing press releases. So Tom said, hey, I'll help you write your press release. I'm like, thank you. <laughs> so Tom actually wrote our press release for the, for the Wood Whisperer Guild. But the Nertacular event, every year for Scott, it gets more and more. It used to just be us getting together and watching a movie. Last year it was us getting together and sharing, doing a session like this and doing podcast live and it, it kind of brings that whole community together and we're really fortunate to be a part of it. And in a case like this, I mean, you guys are at an event where you have some really brilliant people walking around this place with you. Not only the people giving sessions, but people in this room are incredibly intelligent. So make as many friends as you can because you never know who has the secret that's going to be your next big thing right. on your website. Unlock your, your ideas. <clears throat> Alright, so now, this year was pretty um, pretty big for us. In April, Nicole was able to finally quit her job. Yeah, and quickly, right to work. Yes. <laughs> and ultimately for me, that was always my primary mission was to, like, she took a, a huge gamble on me. She let me leave my job, the career I had gone to school for, uh, to start doing woodworking. Now, granted, what we, where we ended up is completely different than where I thought I was going to be, but I knew if I ever got to the point that I could make it successful enough, the way to pay her back was to let her quit her job um, and, and work for the business. And we're and traveling. Oh. <laughs> yeah, so, so that finally happened in April. Uh, we also started focusing, this was really one of the things I needed her to focus on, was we had a lot of advertising deals that, as the content producer, the, the person doing the filming, the editing, the actual posting of the, the stuff online, I just don't really have that much time. So there's, there's a lot of advertising opportunities that were left on the table because I don't have the time to make that phone call or write that email. So just closing deals alone for her was enough to pretty much make up what would be her salary. Um, well, and, and, your salary. Yeah. <laughs> well, and to 
to kind of use the connections that we've built over the years. Yeah. Now, you know, the economy is better, and they, they're, they are connected to us. They know us, and they now have advertising dollars that they would love to spend with us. Mm -hmm. So being able to say, hey, how can we do things with you? And that's really kind of what my job became was focusing on advertising and what we can do with partners that we really, like we don't partner with anybody that Mark wouldn't use. Like we've turned down advertisers before, it just wasn't in line with us. So we're very selective in that point. Uh, also launching, um, we've been giving away stuff. I mean, people send Mark, our uh, companies send uh, stuff to Mark all the time, but there was really no structured way on how we did it. Um, I found a service called Raffle Copter that is amazing, I love it. And this is how I handle and manage my, and it's fair. And it, it just makes everything it Automates easier. everything. It automates you. it all. So, um, and then focusing on YouTube. I and mean, YouTube over the past year, maybe a little bit longer, it changed, like something happened. And like, it's a big deal now to be on YouTube. I, Mark, I, I'm actually going through our archive because there would be times in, in over the course of six years that Mark would get just mad at YouTube and say, well, I'm not uploading my video. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to go back. <laughs> I'm going back to fill in the gaps of the videos he decided YouTube wasn't worthy to get at that point. <laughs> well, in the beginning, YouTube was an option yeah. early on. I was like, well, I could post to YouTube, but you know what? I'm going to post to Blip TV because they give me permalinks to my files, and I can put that in an RSS feed. And if I want to post it to YouTube for some extra views, I can. Well, now it's more of an essential thing. If you're making online video, you kind of need to be in YouTube. And YouTube, as an environment, is uh, making a video for YouTube is very different mm -hmm. than, than when I make a video for woodworkers on my website. We're much more tolerant of a 12 minute video. I post a 12 minute video on YouTube and it's like, ah, too long, bleh. Yeah. So, <laughs> so it's very frustrating when you're trying to tell a story yeah. and teach someone how to build something, but most of these people are armchair hobbyists. They're not that interested, but if you, if you take too long to explain something, they're gonna walk away. So you have to decide when you make your content, who your audience is and who you want to, to gather. And, and is, is your subscriber count on YouTube that important to sacrifice the amount of information you want in your content? I don't know, you gotta make that decision. Yeah. But we didn't really, in the past, that we never felt like we needed to make that decision, but now we do, so it's kind of a bigger deal. It's, um, a, it's an interesting animal, and we, we haven't figured it out, and we go back and forth all the time, so. Yeah. But we're definitely increasing our presence yeah. there. Yeah. Uh, the other big thing that happened this just uh, a couple days ago, actually, we received our shipment of books. I had my first real book uh, called Hybrid Woodworking, published with um, the parent company of Popular Woodworking, which is F and W Media. And uh, yeah, so that's out now. Yeah. Should be. We have a free copy. There's a Wood Whisperer bundle. I think they're raffling away. So it's a really, I, I personally think it's a great book for anyone interested in woodworking. Yeah, it's pretty cool, and it's a lot bigger than Intro. my other book. It's a hundred. Yeah. 192 pages, real deal, and I spent the first five or six months of, of this year yeah. uh, writing this thing, and it was it was quite an undertaking. I actually expected a lot more help from the publisher than I got. Um, I'm like, so no one's gonna come out and help me take pictures. No one's gonna no one's gonna help me write captions. Uh, something, anything. Um, so if you ever write a book and you need tips. Yeah, it was it was a lot of work, but ultimately, you know, again, just like when I wrote for Pop Woodworking the first time the whole legitimization aspect. I never consider myself a writer. I certainly never thought I would ever be referred to as an author of any type. Um, so just to be here now in 2013, and it's pretty pretty darn cool. So looking forward to where that's gonna take us, who knows. It's pretty cool. Pretty cool. What else do we have here? We got uh, ah, closing thoughts. Closing thoughts. A bulleted list, everyone's favorite. <laughs> Yeah, you, you wrote that. Yes. So, you, you so that. it is. I, I mean, I, I hope by taking you through the, the last six, seven years, it's a lot of work. And especially when we were first launching the website, I mean, we would stay up till 2 a.m. and just powering through and just kind of setting up things and, you know, teaching ourselves. I mean, I remember Mark having to learn WordPress because I was on the road. I'm like, you got to figure it out because I'm not there to help you. So just kind of pulling into your re pulling in your resources, utilizing the internet, making yeah. contact. I mean, it's just a lot of work. And I, I don't want to sugarcoat it because there's a lot of sources online. Quit your job and make this money, and uh, mm -hmm. you usually have guru in your name. Um, and it's just it's a lot of work. 
don't think it's not. Well, and, and hopefully you've seen in the progression from 2006 that it's a lot of baby steps. Like yeah. this was not a master plan. Where we are today, neither one of us could have mapped this out. It's right. just where we ended up. Um, and jumping down to the third thing is to be flexible, and that's I think how we were able to do this. Unlike a big, you know, a, a big business where there's a lot of permission that needs to be asked, we don't have to ask anybody for anything. When we're ready to make a change, we make it. If we decide we want to do another app tomorrow, she can start working on it. If something isn't working, we can back out of it. As long as we're not, you know, damaging our relationship with our, our viewers and our customers, it's fine. We can make these last-minute decisions on our business. So flexibility is it a, a big advantage that we have over more traditional businesses, and that's what helped us take those baby steps to where we are today. Yeah. Uh, of course, that's very important, number two. Having a kid does not make it easier. <laughs> um, let's see. Yeah, okay, this is, this is important, too. We do listen, as Nicole said before, we listen to a lot of podcasts uh, about business. We listen to a lot of audiobooks about classic business practices, marketing, things like that. And, and like you said, we always have a, a couple of little tidbits that we take out of it that really help us. And 95% of it is stuff that it either isn't applicable to what we're doing, or you have to be very carefy, careful of the source because there's a lot of people out there who are talking about how to do all this, and they've never actually sold a product in their life, a real product. They're selling the information product on how to sell products. Mm -hmm. That's not exactly the success story you want. So when you're looking at these sources, look at what the person has actually done. Have, have they run their own business selling a product having nothing to do with online marketing? That's and why we have like they the done podcast brothers because they were doing, uh, they had a website um, for trading, like trader interviews or something right, like right. that. So they were pulling from their experience. Izzy was doing Foolish Adventure with Tim Conley and we really enjoyed listening to that because... Which is still a great podcast, yeah, even yeah. though Izzy's not on it mm. anymore. But uh, that's a great, with uh, Tim Conley. He's a good example. He's a guy who had his own business, who was running his own business, and uh, did a great job with it. And now he's got a lot of information to share. Uh, we'll go through these very quick. Utilize your support system. That should be clear from what we've talked about already. All these people, we're getting the finger. Oh, sorry. I, I just want to say that a lot of what we do, we have our own strengths. And we utilize and do a collaboration and brainstorming a lot. And that's how we, we talk through a lot of things. So if you can find a partner or your spouse or someone um, to kind of be, help you with this, it really does help a lot. You don't feel alone. So um, I will leave you, because we threw out a bunch of you know products and services and podcasts. So before we came here, I created a, a post on NicoleSag.com slash resources with everything we referred to, uh, plus some more. So our favorite books, uh, the services that we use, and uh, the podcasts that we listen to from a business perspective. So that's uh, available for you to go to right now. Thank you. which is uh, Scott Salkin, it has the flu, so he's not going to be here, so if you're uh, going to attend that session, go to another one instead. And also, uh, Mark, uh, Mark and Nicole donated a prize pack, so if you want that copy of the hybrid word working, that's one of the things we're giving away as part of that prize pack, so that's one of the raffles that we're going to be doing at the end of the day today. To the room! If anybody has questions or anything, my email is on this website, so feel free to email me.